Thank you everyone for coming along. Um, and I guess um, we'll take, go on this journey and, and see how we go. Um, and thank you to Alistair and thank to Food Solutions for um, providing me with this opportunity. Um, and that, do that. So I guess, as Alistair mentioned, uh, oh, we spent a lot of time of different projects with Wood Solutions and Forest Wood and Wood Products Australia. And, and this technical guide, which is number 24, we drafted back in 2012 and Wood Solutions and, and, and our team at UTAS spent three years convincing industry that this is what we need to do. And it was eventually published in 2015. And so many things that are in this guide are still very relevant today for our six star housing. Um, and, 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 and you'll see a few of these slides come up during the presentation today. And I guess this is one. So this is, you know, we were talking way back then about the issues of moisture and water vapor and management inside your cladding of the building. And we're talking about how you need to think about roof space ventilation and what you should be doing in walls. Um, and importantly, really most of the principles we're talking about for climate zones three, four, five, and six and seven, eight are still very relevant today. Um, our, our thoughts for climate zone one and two, when we're using the terms non-breathable, um, is, is incorrect and and we've learnt a lot more since then. And the other thing we you'll see in a lot of documentation by particular manufacturers and and an old documentation from other countries is the word barrier. And I guess we know within the real world um, that there is no such thing as a perfect barrier. And and so I could say that's such a 1990s term, but I won't be that harsh just yet. So context and why we are where we are and the context of regulatory change. So I'm sure we've all heard about the climate change stuff. Th these graphs are from um, CSIRO and we can see here, this is the increase in carbon um, dioxide, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, I'll get it right, parts per million from 1980 to now. And we can see how that's increased significantly. With, we use the other research from CSIRO where they've been taking the core samples from the Antarctic and we get what is often referred to as the hockey stick, where we can see how we've drastically or significant, significantly changed the atmosphere in the last 100 or 200 years. What does that mean? Well, this is data about ocean heat and three quarters of the planet is ocean. And if I take a glass of water and I warm it up slowly, the water expands. So when we talk about climate change and sea level rise, yes, there's a bit that comes from ice melting and glaciers melting, but a really big part of it is just the fact that three quarters of the planet is water. And as you warm it, that water is going to expand, which is sea level rise. Australia's response to this, well, we had a carbon reduction plan um, with one particular government, and that has significant reduction in our carbon emissions. Um, the next government changed its methodology, and we can see here the graph of our carbon emissions in Australia. The orange -y and browny coloured lines pointing downward are what the government wishes to achieve. And you might notice there's a big disparity between what is happening and what is intended. So in the context of that, we have the National Energy Productivity Plan, which is a COAG document, which is exploring various aspects of how to reduce our carbon emissions, and at the same time maintain national productivity. And then we have the National Construction Code Energy Efficiency Regulations. But then think about housing. So whether we were living in an 1870s, 1960s, or a 2003 house, in most parts of Australia, there's a very, very, very high chance that those houses have no insulation and are extremely leaky. So I might as well be living in the 1870s house rather than a 2003 house, because it's probably going to be very similar in terms of its interior environment. We jump forward to 2010, where most states are having, are having between five and six star housing as the minimum expectation. And we've now got a very different built fabric on many of our houses, lots and lots of components going together to make up our external walls. We have significantly improved thermal comfort and hopefully we have improved occupant health. So we're now making warmer houses. And this is a significant benefit for short term and lifelong respiratory and cardiovascular conditions. That is internationally accepted. Um, there's no ifs or buts in that context. 
But then at the same time, in Australia, and, and, and this is an Australian issue at the moment, uh, are we oversimplifying things? So how do we count energy? I'm not going to go too much into that just now. Um, how do we count comfort? Are we considering interior air quality? Are we considering water vapour? And what are the ideal conditions for mould to grow and to spore? And it's mould spores that affect us very significantly in the context of human health. If I consider building regulations from other countries like Germany, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Canada, US, um, we often see guidance notes in their regulatory documents like this. So buildings are often not used as intended by occupants. So designers and builders need to err on the side of caution and adopt robust fail-safe built fabric solutions to ensure safe interior environments are achieved. So, and, and the reason why those sort of statements occur in other building regulations from other countries is often the health act of those countries is intrinsically linked to the building regulations. We don't have that in Australia at this point in time, but it's just that sort of context of where the interior health is considered of buildings. So then we have to think in our context, what is the function of National Construction Code? Is it for good building design and construction outcomes? Well, the answer is no. It's a very big no, because the function of the National Construction Code is for the minimum acceptable methods. That's it, the minimum. It's the, you know, if you build a house any worse than this, it's unsafe for occupants. And, and so a bit of context is always important. And we've been, many, many people are working to just meet the code. And that's the minimum acceptable method of construction or design. This is one of my only, I've only got one movie in, and I guess it's just always interesting to have a bit of a think about what is happening. This is one of our many infrared cameras we've stuck in a roof space. And we can, this, this has a thermally bridged sarking system. It, the roof space is extremely leaky, meaning it's not airtight. It's as leaky as buggery, I'll say that. But it hasn't got what we call structured ventilation. There's no thought about where cool air can come in low and where the warm air can leave high. Uh, this roof also has a high solar reflectance. So rather than the roof space warming up from the sun hitting the roofing material, uh, most of that sun energy is being reflected. So it's always interesting we look at the myriad of things that go into the physics of our roof space. At the same time, um, you know, I can, if I, uh, there's virtually an article every couple of days these days between the commercial press and the ABC regarding people having to move out of their homes, retirement villages, people moving out of their rooms, hospitals having problems with mould. There's a continual stream of news items regarding unhealthy buildings, creating unhealthy people. Um, and, you know, and, and when we talk about unhealthy, 25% of the world's population we call canaries, I meaning you put them in a mouldy space and they're gonna, the nose starts to run. They have an immediate allergic reaction. The other 75% of us, well, we don't have immediate response, but over time we get very sick. And yes, we might be able to be healed from some of those illnesses, but some of those illnesses we cannot be healed from. And it's in a lifelong illness. So where does Nathurst fit in this? The diagram on the right shows really what the remit or the legisl legislation allows NATHERS to consider. And the NATHERS remit is purely about the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that may be caused by house operation. Nothing more, nothing less. We often talk about whether NATHERS should include condensation and mould, but it's not allowed to because it's not within its legislated remit. So then it falls back on the National Construction Code to require minimum health and amenity within the built environment. So that's why we, you see the new regulations that came into play in 2019 are within the health and amenity part of the code. But is this a new problem? It's not. If you look at the literature, and I guess that's what I have to do being an academic, is that th since the 1900s, there have been hundreds and hundreds of conferences and thousands of publications. The first conference in America was in 1934. 
and 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 that was discussing problems in school buildings and apartment buildings about condensation and mold in New York. So it's not a new thing. We have known for a very long time that building conditioning, water vapor in the air, water vapor diffusion, interstitial condensation, and mold growth are all intrinsically linked to us having conditioned buildings. So conditioning our buildings is an interesting link. I've just said that, so I'll skip that. So we're a designer or a builder, and we're drawing a piece, a line on a page, and we're saying this line represents something. And that line rep often represents many, many, many things. Now, how is that line considering thermal conductivity? And that's heat flow through materials. How's it considering thermal mass? So what is a thermal mass? How does it work? People often say to me, since 2010, what's the rule of thumb? Up until we had four-star housing, yes, there were many rules of thumb. But since we moved way beyond four-star housing, everything has changed. And the rules of thumb are often incorrect. How we think about our insulation, and it has to be continuous insulation. The framing factors, that's what the framing material is made from and how much the wall is framing versus how much the wall is insulation. Other countries require you to do a calculation to show that your average insulation value of the wall meets the minimum requirement. We don't do that in Australia. How are we considering thermal bridging? How are we considering air tightness? How are we considering water vapour diffusion? How are we considering thermal comfort of the people inside? How are we measuring the building to know if what we thought would happen did happen? And if it didn't happen, how do we make it better next time? How are we simulating the building? And not simulating the building at the end of the design process, but simulating the building as a key component of the design process. Human health. How we make, you know, if, if we're just making buildings that people are going to be in for 16 to 20 hours a day, how are we ensuring that we're not affecting their short and long-term health? And then we've got building regulation. So every line we draw on a page affects lots and lots of things. As a bit of a side step or step to the left, you know, have we done this before? Well, we have. We reduce unwanted heat loss and gain by the use of insulation. So this straw, this grass building has about 100 mils of grass on the roof. That's about R3. This is circa, you know, 15, 14, 1300s construction and had an R3 roof system. Shade solar radiation. Yep, it's got nice broad eaves trying to stop the sun from hitting other surfaces. Permit solar radiation when required. Yep, where this is located, they don't want solar radiation. So they're maximizing shading to reduce that. Appropriate size ventilation. Yes. Appropriate access for daylight, yes. Appropriate location of thermal mass. In this context, the ground which is shaded is the thermal mass. And the appropriate amount of thermal mass relative to climate, relative to wherever it is, relative to what sun it receives or doesn't receive. The larger the surface area per volume material, the more rapid the heat flow. That's a long one. What that means is that if I've got a flat piece of board, the surface is flat, meaning that heat flow in and out of the surface is relative to that amount of surface area. If I have a raked brick wall, I've got the same wall surface area in a simple terms, but I'm going to have got a much greater amount of surface to the air. So, I've got, so the amount of energy that wall can absorb or the amount of energy that wall can release is now much more. This grass hut, the woven grass, has a much greater surface area than a flat piece of masonite. So how these things come into play? It's a renewable resource. It's chemical and VOC free. It's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of research in Australia about how housing up until the early 70s was often chemical and VOC free, whereas new houses are very chemical rich. How it's how we considering carbon storage, embodied energy and embodied water. That's the water to make materials. So things to ponder. So back in 2012 and 2015, we were saying, look, we need to get people to think about how human comfort works. 
because we're all focusing on air temperature, air temperature. Well, the reality is that two thirds of how we experience an environment is what we call mean radiant temperature. So I'm sitting in a meeting room at the moment and two thirds of what I'm feeling is the temperature of the floor, the walls and the ceiling. Only one third of what I'm feeling is the temperature of the air. So the whole focus on building regulations or energy efficiency is how to make those surfaces the right temperature for us with the least amount of energy. And so back then we had diagrams like this talking about where's energy coming from, where the energy flows, and what does that mean? If I then take a step back and think, okay, well, let's look at the greater picture of what, where the world's at and, and where regulations are going. And we start talking about the life cycle engineering for sustainable buildings. Well, Australia's a bit behind the game, but generally speaking around the world, net zero buildings, yeah, we've done it. We know what to do. America has a whole government program advising homeowners on how to do net zero energy buildings. So we know that it's done. But the risk we have is to ensure that we have durability still. And, and that's another issue in the context of sustainability. Materials, there's been a lot of investment and even the Australian National Energy Productivity Plan is looking at how industry reduces its carbon emissions in the context of making materials. At the same time, we know internationally that we need to move to a greater amount of renewable materials in our construction stream. The challenge we have is that many of those materials are less durable. So that requires better design. Around the world, material is becoming scarce. Sand is becoming scarce. Silica is becoming scarce. So there's a greater thinking about how to recycle materials. But once again, is the recycled material going to perform as good as the new material? And a current matter of urgency in the Europe is with buildings that are being renewed is that they find that with many of the commercial and residential buildings that have, been, that have been constructed with fire retardants and treated timber are now classified as toxic waste, meaning they can't be recycled and they can't go to traditional landfill. They are toxic waste. Um, so these are things to consider as we move forward in Australia. This is a diagram we've been using for the last four years now. Um, and Professor Kuntzel from Front Office Institute is a research colleague of mine. And think about, well, the game's changed. And so if you think about how we design now, design buildings, the first thing we do is actually manage solar radiation. If we've got a well inside house that's airtight, generally speaking, most energy you need to heat the house will come from us and limited solar gain. Or if we're in North Australia, we don't want sun at all. So it's really about how we stop the sun hitting it. Um, so it's quite contradictory when we start seeing all these buildings with lots and lots of glass because that's just letting the sun in. So radiation control is actually the first point of design. The next point is that you know, anything about, and it gets a bit of detailing, is about how we're considering air tightness and in terms of conditioning systems, how we think about enthalpy recovery. So whether it's a heating or cooling plant, how we're not wasting our energy on what we've created in terms of conditioned air, but having a bit more intelligence in our systems. Insulation, well, we know how to insulate, but we're just going to do it better. So the whole thing about how we're providing continuous insulation and how we're addressing thermal bridging properly, not tokenistically. Dynamic performance control. So HVAC dynamics has humidification, dehumidification functions, even the basic split system on the wall. And high growth thermal storage are concrete, all materials in the building, every single material absorbs and releases inner materials, actually more thermal mass. Finally, we have air humidity. So how we allow, how are we designing the interior of a building such that the air humidity is maintained at a set and an acceptable level? And if you're being real about the world, we cannot stop condensation. It's a physical thing that happens. What we want to do is have material choices and material assemblies that allow for that wetting to occur, but we're controlling how much wetting does occur and we're promoting the drying of those materials. 
So from that, we've generally had five key principles for effective envelopes. The first is the thermal control layer, how reducing contact between warm and cool building materials. The vapor control layer, how a material that allows the climatically appropriate passive flow of water vapor. A water control layer, moisture forms on the interior and exterior surface of cladding materials. So when you think about how we're managing that moisture and that, helping that moisture leave the building. Ventilation, so this is, an, this is about how we're designing passive ventilation strategies for roof spaces, wall cavities and subfloor spaces. Subfloor spaces have had required regulated sub ventilation um, since the 1960s. So it's how we're thinking about this in other spaces. And finally, how we apply these principles in a bushfire location as well. So once again, not new, we we're talking about these issues in our technical design guide number 24. Um, other thoughts on the side though, we can see some were bridging from a typical downlight. There's no insulation of a top downlight. It's an aluminium or metal, metal frame. So it's just condensing around the downlight. Um, the, the middle image we're seeing the bottom plate and air leakage around the bottom plate and mold growing in the corner of the house. The top image is a, a thermally bridged roof and the bottom right is a weatherboard that's rotted from the inside out because the water vapor is trying to leave the building and wetting the inside of the weatherboard and rotting it from the inside out. So if you think about the thermal control layer a bit more, houses typically were very poorly insulated. Heat moves through the walls quite easily. With energy efficiency, well insulated walls. So now the heat moves through the walls much more slowly. So in that context, when heating, all the elements between the interior lining and the exterior cladding are much warmer. Or for cooling, all the elements between the interior lining and exterior cladding are now much cooler. So we've actually changed the temperature of the materials in the wall. If we click over to infrared imagery, and this is an image of a uninsulated home. And in this old house, the exterior cladding is hot relative to the, the environment. In this well inside house, in this new building, the exterior cladding is cold, which is why moisture forms on it. Moisture forms on the inside surface of the cladding because it is cold because we're keeping the heat inside the building, not outside the building. In terms of thinking about building membranes, our Australian standards, once again, is follow the code. They're the minimum. They're not good. They're the minimum. And so our Australian standards have the membranes terminating at bottom plates, terminating at top plates. Whereas if you're actually achieving an airtight system, when you think about how those membranes are continuous and how they're taped or what methods that really ensure it's doing the function we're wanting it to do. Um, and these images, the top left is you know, a, a, a European product that's put on the inside of the building um, to actually achieve an interior and air tightness. The top right is a sarking system under battens, which is common in most countries and required in most countries around the world. Um, the image on the left at the bottom is a house where the frame has been insulated and there's an insulation layer on the outside of the frame as well to get a higher thermal performance. And the bottom right is the, one of our locals in terms of thinking about how we actually put insulation on the walls and we put our membranes on and batten out for our cladding. So water vapour. All air contains water vapour. We often refer to it as relative humidity. The warmer the air, the more weight of water vapour can hold, a bit like a sponge. Warm air loses water vapour as it cools, which can cause fog, and condensation on the ground and other surfaces. When air cools from 21 degrees Celsius to 13 degrees Celsius, moisture or condensation will form on the cooler surfaces. So if I've got my air conditioner running inside at 21 degrees Celsius and it's 13 degrees Celsius outside, moisture is forming somewhere between the inside surface and the outside surface of the wall. And I guess we've all seen our glasses of beer with nice condensation, which we actually enjoy because it gives us a good sign that the beer is cool. So research from one of my PhD students were looking at lots of issues, including how much water vapor is generated in a home. 
So a two-person household over one month can generate 240 litres of water vapour. And I can say in many of the houses I've looked at, that's, yep, it's trapped inside the house. It hasn't been allowed to escape. I'm sitting here in this office yakking away, so I'm making 70 grams of water vapour per hour just sitting here. If I was doing some housework, I'd be banking 90 grams of water vapour per hour. Our cooking, our dishwashing, our bathing, all these activities we do in the house add water vapour to the house. So it's not an equilibrium. Equilibrium would be the same as outside, but inside the house, we're adding more and more water vapour to the environment and the system needs to achieve equilibrium. But coming back to our human health and energy efficiency, well, we know that for human health reasons in many parts of Australia, we need the temperature between 14 degrees Celsius and 25. Below 14 degrees Celsius, it's internationally been proven that we get sick and die. Above 28 degrees Celsius, we get sick and die. So we have a very finite temperature range for human health. Um, this is um, looking at relative humidity. So many of the buildings we've measured and colleagues from Melbourne, Sydney and Western Australia have measured and the CSIRO, they found many, many houses and apartments where the relative humidity is between 85 and 95%, which is very high. If we overlay that data onto a mould graph, we can see that we're creating environments where mould growth will love us. Ideal environments for mould growth. And so, and we can see the bottom line here for mould growth is somewhere between 75 and 80%. So if I've got more than 75% relative humidity in a home, I have provided them ideal environment for mould to grow. And I guess this is in the background why most office spaces have their air conditioning set at 55% relative humidity, because I do not want the relative humidity to get anywhere near that mold growth value. You can see here this slide, it's showing, um, this is another version of a mold growth diagram. The bottom axis is showing the temperature. The right hand axis is talking about what the food is for mold. Our dust is awesome food for mold. Cellulose in wood is great for mold paper on plasterboard. Um, I've got photos of mould growing on foil where dust is collected. It just needs a bit of food. And then importantly, the lower limit of mould growth at about 18 degrees Celsius is 75% relative humidity. So what is really important about this is that we do not need to have visible moisture for mould to grow. 75% relative humidity is nowhere near a visible presence of moisture. So it's how we're designing our buildings to keep relative humidity below 75%. If we consider a heating environment, generally speaking, the water vapour is always trying to leave the building. And a cooling environment, the water vapour is trying to enter the building. So we have to think about how we're developing vapour permeable envelope systems that are climate appropriate that supports that process. It's when we don't do that and we use vapour and pimple envelope systems that we're actually trapping that moisture. It could be trapped in the wall frame, it could be trapped in the house. Whether it's steel or timber or concrete, it doesn't matter. The same things happen. And way back in then, when we wrote that guide, we were talking about different materials. What are vapour permeable materials? What are vapour semi permeable materials? Through to what are vapour impermeable materials? And then we also have what we call unintended mass air and water vapour transport. So the image on the left is a typical cavity sliding door. It's a beautiful chimney vent to take the water vapour in the house into the roof space. And the image on the right is a typical tastic ventilator. Yes, it's got a tube for a fan, but if you notice the entire fitting is full of holes. If the fitting didn't have all those holes, the heat from the globes would melt the casing. So that is a permanent vent between a high humid space and the roof space. Um, and, and also for the whole of the house. It's a, if it, depending on how the house is planned and designed, that nice warm air from the house is always going up into the roof space. So how much is too much or how much does, you know, is good? And so really to drive home the point that we don't stop condensation, 
This is a test wall. And what we're seeing on the right-hand side is the outside face of the test wall. And what we can see, and this wall has a five millimeter hole. So a five millimeter drill hole in the wall. And we can see here on, an, on a daily basis, when it gets cool each evening, the moisture forming on the outside, on the inside surface of the outside plane. Now, it, when they did this research, after they did this bit, they then taped the hole and moisture still formed every cold cycle, which once again comes back to these issues that we, there is no such thing as a, there's no such thing as a perfect membrane. There's no such thing as a perfect taping system. These are all just control layers. I mean, we think about how we actually manage the system because there is no such thing as perfection. So what does it mean in terms of different climates in Australia? So in Launceston, where I'm based normally, 91% of the hours in a year are less than 18 degrees Celsius. So that means for 91% of the time, water vapor is trying to go from the house or the building to the outdoors. Melbourne, up across the ditch, 88% of the hours in Melbourne, it's less than 18 degrees Celsius. So if we're keeping a house to 18 degrees Celsius, for 88% of the time, water vapor is trying to leave. Richmond, Sydney, not Richmond, remember, this is Richmond in Western Sydney, 72% of the time, water vapor is trying to leave the house. Sydney, you know, we get a bit more of a coastal environment, it's still 65% of the time. And Amberley, so this is um, inland of Brisbane, 50% of the hours in the year are less than 18 degrees Celsius. So 50% of the time, water vapor is trying to leave the house. A little bit of red zone there, that's when it's now getting above that 28 degrees Celsius. So in those cases, the people will be turning their air conditioning on and water vapor will be trying to come in. And finally, we have Darwin, which of course is the other side where for most of the year, we'd have the air conditioning on and water vapor is trying to enter the space. Um, back when I went to uni, we used to do what we used to call condensation risk analysis, where we'd say, oh, this is the temperature inside and this is the temperature outside. The red line is the temperature, the blue line is the dew point. And if they crossed, that meant condensation was occurring. And I would say quite happily, that's so 1970s. Or as my father, my kids would say, oh, that's boomer stuff, dad. This is how we do it now. This is the so 2020 stuff. The image on the right is using an international software, world leading software, um, which we've been using in our research. And we've also, and then you see a little logo at the bottom saying OzHigra1, which is where we've been developing interfaces with that software to use really important data that we have from Australia. The top graph, which is a red one, is showing the outdoor temperature on the left and the indoor temperature on the right. So we can see how the indoor temperature is going up and down. That's based on a NATO simulation. And we can see what's happening as the heat flows through the wall. The green line, the next graph down, is the relative humidity. So we can, and we've been simulating the relative humidity in those spaces with software. So we've got an interior temperature and an interior relative humidity. And we can see how the relative humidity ranges inside between about 35 and 80%. And but we can also see how at the interface of the wall where the membrane is, how the relative humidity is often at 100%. And we can see the relative humidity on the outside of the wall, which is a mixture of daily influxes of moisture from the air. And the bottom line, the, the line at the bottom, the blue line is moisture. So that's moisture accumulating. Now, if that moisture was appearing and going, appearing and going each day, we wouldn't be concerned. But what we can see in this simulation here is that the moisture is continuing to accumulate inside the wall. So this wall is an unsafe wall to build in that climate. So coming back to our different points, thermal, vapor, water, and ventilation. So a typical old fashioned direct clad wall, what we call a direct clad wall, didn't tick any of those boxes. The cladding being wet on the inside would wet the structure that would wet the membrane. There was no air control around the insulation and there's no ventilation in the wall system. If you then say, okay, 
we'll presume the outside, the, the water control layer, the principal water control layer is the cladding. But as I mentioned before, we know the inside of the cladding is going to get wet. It is going to get wet. So how are we going to And the outs and on the inside, we've got our interior lining. And for the sake of this argument, we'll follow the code where it says that plasterboard, and that has power points and it's glued and fixed with a two mil gap to a frame, is our air control layer. You can hint some cynicism. You probably sense my cynicism in that statement. We need our insulation hard against that lining because coming back to our thermal comfort thing, we need the lining to be at the right temperature so we feel comfortable. We've known for more than 50 years that we need to put a layer on the outside of the insulation so the insulation is in a still airspace. Otherwise you have heat loss and wind wash effect that quickly diminish the effectiveness of the insulation. Yes, we have to think about how we allow space for moisture to drain down the inside surface of the cladding system. We've done that with brick construction since the seven or 1600s because we knew the inside brick could not touch, touch the outside brick. Otherwise people get very sick. The air control layer might also be a vapor control layer. It might be the same product. And so how are we considering allowing the vapor to leave the building and enter the drainage cavity? or vapor cavity. And so something can say, yep, we're ticking all those boxes. And we're talking about these issues back in the guide in 2015. I'm just gonna quickly skim through some of these, but these are examples of drawings of, of walls, whether it's a timber framed wall, whether it's a standard wall, whether it's a bushfire wall, whether it's a wall with extra insulation on the outside to achieve higher R values, whether it's a concrete slab wall, all the uh, sorry, concrete slab floored building, all the same principles apply. And the same principles, the exact same principles apply to the roof. So we have a, a lining, we have an insulator on top of our lining, we have our roofing material, we have a sarking product. So the exact same principles apply to our roof system. And so we, we don't want roofs where the sarking is thermally bridging and it's not ventilated and it's, we're not. And you know, we're not thinking of all these different issues. You think about, we need to think about how our sarking does provide a ventilation cavity, how the moisture that does form on the inside of the roofing can be collected and drained away, and how we have ventilation to remove the water vapour. And so whether we're looking at a high pitch roof where it could be, sorry, um, above, which is above internationally, above 60 degrees is a high pitch roof. So whether we're considering how we do that in a high pitch roof with vapor impermeable or vapor pendle sarking, or on a roof pitch between five and 16 degrees, where internationally, most countries require a vapor pendle sarking. When we get below 16 degrees, moisture has a greater tendency to drip. So the concept here is that more of the moisture forms on the top side of the sarking because it goes through as vapour and turns to water, rather than forming in the underside and dripping onto the ceiling. Or we have low pitch roofs, which are less than five degrees. Now, Australian low pitch roofs are very Australian. They're not that common in other countries. And the reason why is that they are what is internationally called a high risk roof system, meaning it's liable to fail. And so they're very hard to get insurance in other countries. So you can see they've got a highlight install blanket system as per manufacturer specifications. Now that's not just something you've snapshot off the web page. That's where you want a drawing with the manufacturer's stamp and date and name about how to do a flat roof system with their product. Because if it doesn't work, it's the builder or the architect or the bin designer or draftsman who is at risk. Um, so just be aware, low pitch roofs are not allowed in, as we build them in Australia in most other countries. Roof space ventilation, we can have continuous gaps, or we can have regular space vents. And I won't get into too much detail here, but generally speaking, once again, for a high pitch roof, you can have less ventilation for a low pitch roof, you need more ventilation. And you need to be considering exhaust and supply. And the ABC, we have a nice little movie, which they did about how to calculate roof space ventilation. 
And so the same principles apply, whether it's a cathedral roof, whether it's a pitch roof, whether it's a parapet roof, whatever roof system it is, how are you considering whether it's a continuous vent strategy or an evenly spaced vent strategy, how you're designing to achieve that result. And think about in terms of bushfire, there's a range of products in terms of stainless steel fly screen mesh, which is two millimeters and it's used by many people. Compressed from minimal insulation, it allows water to drain through, but it blocks ventilation and other proprietary products that are appearing on the market. And, if it, and just to show I'm not blowing my own trumpet, these are, these are typical um, roof design manuals from other countries, and they show that how we have all these layers and how we have to have ventilation, whether it's a tile roof, a sheet roof, um, a, it doesn't matter, the same principles are needed. And the reason why is because the interior environment we're creating is so much different to the exterior environment. And then just as something as a side, this, and something to think about, is flat roof systems. And I mentioned before that our, our sheet metal roof flat roofs are a very problematic system as we move forward. Um, if you think about what's done overseas, all the insulation goes on the outside of the roof, not under the roof. So we're actually, so we move from what we call a cold, a cold or a cool roof system to a hot or warm roof system. Um, and, and I won't say too much more because that's a whole lecture in itself, but just about how um, we probably should be, the directions we should be moving with our better insulated homes. And there's a pretty typical details from overseas. Um, so there's the woods, the, the thermal performance guide, which said most of it's pretty correct still. There's a few things which we tinker with in, in terms of improving with what we know today. Um, and we've done a range of guides for the Tasmania um, government, um, which can be found as PDFs. And I guess other information, um, if you need a bit more understanding about condensation buildings, we did a, a, a scoping study for the ABCB, which is on their website. Um, and there's um, also the condensation guide in the ABC website. And then I've got two links there regarding a lot of um, the publications I've done through the University of Tasmania. I'll pause there. So um, thanks, Mark, that, that's uh, fascinating. It, it is really a, an interesting area, isn't it? And uh, you know, I think as we've started to improve the energy efficiency of houses, um, you know, we've, we've seen some of these sort of more moldy problems come up, which is which has certainly been an issue. Um, we've got a couple of questions here at the moment, but I'm sure we'll get some more online. Uh, Richard's asked, is there any possibility of Oz Hygro One data being made available through the NATO's software? Um, okay, so that's a really good question. And, 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 and I'll give you my point of view. <laughs> um, we, it took us 20 years to get the NATO's assessors and NATO's system working well. Um, and, and so, and hydrothermal simulation is bloody complex by comparison. So, so, and if I look at, and I guess if I look to other countries about what other countries have done, what those countries have done is they've used skilled people to do hydrothermal simulation to say, if you build this wall type in this climate, it's a DTS type wall. So that way the code should have, should, um, it's something for everyone to argue for, <laughs> the code should have a bit, a, a range of DTS walls, where if I'm a designer or builder, I can say that wall is gonna be okay in that climate. If I want to do the wall differently, then I need to employ a well-trained consultant. Uh, and the reason why is, I, I'm, I'm saying this is that plasterboard, so every material we're putting in the wall has different vapor resistivity or diffusivity properties. Every material has different conductivity properties. It's not just a case of, oh, the plasterboard wall we put in, in out hers is fine. No, it's not. Is it plain plasterboard? Is it wet area plasterboard? Is it um, acoustic plasterboard? All these products have different, have different diffusivity properties. And I think, at this, at this stage, having um, cowboys, for want of better words, just playing with software and getting answers is going to create more problems and greater risks for both designers and builders. Yep. Actually, Carl makes a bit of a, um, Carl Perkin, he makes a bit of a statement, but, but also a good question. I think it's something we you know, should ponder We're about uh, looking at the indigenous architecture and yes. realizing the design probably hasn't evolved. Maybe it's actually gone backwards, particularly with these sort of, you know, with uh, I suppose sometimes the cheap way we build 
we build and the comments in the New Zealand code focused on restricting air movement some years ago and forgot about controlled ventilation leading to, to moisture and mould problems, you know, which we're hearing here in Australia at the moment as well, um, and the need for a holistic consideration and balance. I mean, just your thoughts on that, because it's exactly right. As we've seen eaters disappear, as we've seen sort of uh, slabs come in rather than raised floors, you know, that, that it's brought on a whole lot of issues we perhaps haven't sort of seen in the past. I agree. And there's so many different threads you go. I could say that and, and, um, Tasmanian Aboriginals, who we happily killed 200 years ago, um, they, they had grass huts that with, um, with 100 mils of grass wall, that R3 insulation. Um, we moved them to an island and stuck them in English huts and they all got sick. <laughs> um, so I, I think there is something really positive in that. The other thing that's really happened, and I can say in, in my lifetime as a kid in Western Sydney and, and helping, on my, helping on the farm and different things, it'd be 40 degrees outside and we just sat under the tree or, or under the veranda and, and we, we, we were wearing our stubbies and our singlet. <laughs> um, today, we don't, our society doesn't want to do that anymore. Um, we go from air conditioned cars to air conditioned offices to air conditioned shops to air conditioned houses. So our expectations of our buildings has changed significantly, whether that's because of our wealth or whatever it might be. Um, we, we, we're we creating very different interior environments. Um, and, and even the amount that car manufacturers spend on this research in their cars to limit solar gain in their cars, to limit condensation forming between the steel and the insulation. Um, yeah, it's, it's all in there. So it's an interesting space. Yeah, it's interesting. I recall, Mark, when you did the work uh, for FWPA some years ago, uh, when we started to tighten up the houses with energy efficiency, you know, it was all about should there be the breeze house and, and, uh, and snug house. And, uh, you know, certainly we've seen in Queensland, the old Queensland to disappear because, you know, the energy efficiency regulations don't sort of uh, model those things correctly. But um, and the question here, um, Richard's asked also, which I was thinking as well, just, uh, you know, Ultimately, what's happened? What happens with passive house standards if we're really sealing up the house? I mean, what's your thoughts with the sort of need for air exchange units and things like that? Really, to sort of improve some of these problems. Okay, I could say the um, what we call HRV, heat recovery ventilators, um, or yeah, or the air exchange units. I actually, I, I'm in. I could say, ooh, I could say I'm increasingly wanting them in the regulations, and, and I'm putting my my foot, my whatever thought out there. The reason I'm saying that is that the code presumes, expects, that we're all going to go home every day and open every window in our house, and, and that's how we're getting the ventilation needs in our housing. Um, in workplaces, we have to have mechanical ventilation with supply and exhaust. But at houses, we say, yes, you're going to open every window in your house every day to create a healthy space. Well, the reality is, whether it's laziness, whether it's noise outside, whether it's security, whatever the reason, whether it's cold outside or hot outside, we don't do that. Um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about how you can go to houses and the windows haven't been open for two or three years, which means that the interior is not getting adequate fresh air. So there's, there's two pathways. One is that we need to re-educate society that they must open their windows, which we don't think they're going to do because if it's 25, if it's 30 degrees outside, they don't want that hot air in. If it's less than 18 degrees outside, they don't want the cold air in. So I think that if, if this is, if, if humans' expectations of particularly in, interior environments, interior environments is going to continue, I think we do need to move to a, sadly, very sadly, <laughs> to a, a mechanical supply system so that the air inside houses is actually safe. And that's not just counting our exhaust, but all this stuff we're putting in our houses with the volatile organic compounds um, and, and how we're creating yeah, what, what's the air inside the house? Yep. A question here from Steve um, around um, roof pitches and foil sacking. He says, do I understand correctly that roof with pitches less than six, 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 16 degrees should not have foil sacking? Correct. It's not allowed in most countries. Um, so, and, I, and the, only provi the only proviso I put there, or, or the difference I put there is that um, there is, it's interesting, we're seeing some really interesting data for, for the top end. And what, what we see is there's some months where that works well. There's other months where, uh, with what we call night sky losses. So night sky can cause a 16 degree difference in the sheet metal to the air temperature because of the radiation being lost to the sky. So we 
can actually have condensation forming on those. There's an area that we definitely need more research. Um, in, in the temperate and the cool temperate climates, yes, um, it should be a permeable sarking system for roof pitches less than 16 degrees. Um, but for those more hot, humid, we really need more research. Okay, thanks. Greg's asked, um, he's been advised by some engineers using continuous gaps or vents in roof spaces contravenes the NCC Section J compliance for no residential, for non-residential, the part 3.12 for residential. Is that the case? Um, no. <laughs> so residential, actually it's interesting. I mentioned in the talk that we've always had re requirements for subfloor insulation, uh, so, so subfloor ventilation. We've always had those requirements. Um, and there's always been requirements that a brick, which gets wet, must have a cavity behind it. But timber gets wet. And so, so interesting. similarly, if you read the code, it actually talks about ventilation and roof spaces. So one part, it says you should have it for durability. Another part, it's, it's a bit confused. Um, and, and, I, and the NATO software, which simulates heat flow through buildings, has inbuilt infiltration rates, so building leakage rates, for roof spaces. So it's, so it's actually a part of, and, and the reason why the NATO software has that, because it had to meet the requirements when it was being tested in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, it had to meet the requirements of what's in other countries. And other countries have always required roof space ventilation. So th th there's this interesting thing there. Um, so yes, and I'm not sure, and the only thing, I'm not trying, trying to think about in section J, I need to get back to section J, but in residential class one, class two, um, Yes. And if the code is still causing problems, this is where we need to be making comments to the code. Yep. So a question here, um, how do you suggest developers that embrace passive house principle should manage for the facilitation of capital raising for projects, given the low awareness in the finance industry regarding the critical importance of the different items that you've discussed today? Oh, that's a big one. Um, it is. <laughs> There's, there, are, there are two pathways. I guess it's interesting. The American government has spent billions, and I, billions, but it's still um, a fraction of one percent of housing, new housing. Um, but that, that they, they, actually, for them, it's actually partly funded by the Defence Department, because um, they see it as a national strategy for, um, yeah, surviving the future. <laughs> um, we don't have that philosophy in Australia yet. So. So there are other countries do have a range of incentives for developers, for homeowners, for lessees, leaseholds, um, to improve their buildings. And there's a lot of talk in Australia about um, some things as we move towards 2025, that the government might require certain things of new buildings or existing buildings for tenants. So there's some interesting questions there. The other thing that's very common in coming just back to the pure passive house question in Europe is in multi-residential, they have co-ops. So these co-ops are spread around Europe and the co-ops build the building for about 30 to 40% less than developers because you haven't got the developer's margin. Um, and, and so there's a, a real big co-op arrangement in Europe for building multi-residential passive house buildings. Hmm. Yep. And uh, at the other end, I guess, uh, question here, what resources are available for options to retrofit older houses for both mm. energy efficiency and moisture control? If, I think this is a, um, if you've got a weatherboard house or a, or a cement sheet or a tinny, yes. If you've got a brick veneer, um, that's a problem. <laughs> so, and, and I guess what, what's challenging for us is that since the 1970s, a very large proportion of our housing in Australia is brick veneer. Um, I've, 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 we've, we did some work for the Victorian government back in 2015, where they did the least cost renovation advisor software. They've moved on to other software since then. They've actually got other tools. So I think the first thing is to look at the government websites about what is possible. Um, I have a PhD student at the moment who's actually looking at this exact issue again um, to provide guidance to the Tasmanian government about method, like, like once you the cost effectiveness um, and at the same time maintaining, it's not just about making the house tight, um, we're talking before about air quality, ventilation. So it's about how we have to think about a staged approach that achieves the energy efficiency desired outcomes, but at the same time creates a healthy interior. Okay, and one final question because we're just about up for time. Have there been any studies related to the use and effectiveness of modern aerogel as a continuous insulation in walls and roofs, particularly um, to the exterior? Yep, there has um, in uh, there's different university studies around the world, and there's 
you know, the, those sort of frontier architects looking at stuff for Antarctica and and um, and the North Pole. Um, not the, so there has been lots of tinkering and playing in those spaces, uh, but not to the extent. I think there was even some Chinese research um, recently where they were looking at putting aerogel between two thin membranes, um, but nothing to the extent that it could be moved to a mass construction system. All right, well, we're just on time. So thanks once again, Mark, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Always sort of love to uh, hear what you've got to say and the passion with which you say it. So uh, thanks once again. Um, just um, reminding those online that uh, if you want to see previous webinars or see a re-recording of this one, just go to that uh, uh, part of the website there, click on the webinar button on Wood Solutions and you'll get the links to all of the webinars and podcasts that we've had previously. Um, we've also got some great little um, uh, videos uh, online at the moment. You can scan the little uh, box there or just go online and look for In Focus, um, some great topics. And we're sort of regularly adding to those as well. So the next uh, Tuesday webinar will be in two weeks time, the 16th of March at 11 a.m. And uh, it'll be about using wood in biophilic design from an architect's perspective with the presenter being Susan Hunt. So thanks once again, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks once again, Mark. Yeah.